Close Source is brought to you with support from the following sustainable brands. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycle clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room all while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the Party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Gabriella Antonis is a visual artist and an ethical trade fashion designer. But Gabriella is also a radical feminist micro-business. She's the one-woman band trying to help you understand why slow fashion is what the earth needs. The one-woman band to help you build your own brand. She can take your fashion line from just a concept and do your sketches, pattern making, grading, sourcing, cutting, and sewing. The second option is for those who aren't trying to start a business and who just want ethical garments. Gabriella Antonis will create custom made-to-measure garments just for you. Her goal is to help one person of any size at a time, including beyond size 40. To inquire about this serendipitous intersectional offering of either concept, DM her on Instagram to book a consultation. Please follow her on Instagram and Twitter at Gabriella Antonis. And that's Gabriella with one L. Gotta get that spelling right. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at dylanpagelifeandstyle. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand-blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. Karen Kinney Studio. Located in Western Massachusetts, Karen specializes in handcrafted earrings from found, upcycled, and repurposed fabrics, as well as other eco-friendly curios, all with a hint of nostalgia, a dollop of whimsy, a dash of color, and 100% fun. Karen is an artist slash designer who believes the materials we use matter. See more on Instagram at Karen Kinney Studio or online at www.cKinney.com. Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. Blank Cass, or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles. By embodying the love, craft, and energy 
that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment. I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass, and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Located in Whistler, Canada, Velvet Underground is a velvet jungle full of vintage and secondhand clothing, plants, a vegan cafe, and lots of rad products from other small sustainable businesses. Our mission is to create a brand and community dedicated to promoting self-expression, as well as educating and inspiring a more sustainable and conscious lifestyle, both for the people and the planet. Find us on Instagram at shop underscore velvet underground or online at www.shopvelvetunderground.com. St. Evans is a New York City based vintage shop that is dedicated to bringing you those special pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just a store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a different charitable organization each month. For the month of January, St. Evans is supporting Remake, a community of fashion lovers, women's rights advocates, and environmentalists on a mission to change the industry's harmful practices on people and our planet. New Vintage is released every Thursday at wearstevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens. That's where St. Evans. Country Feedback is a mom and pop record shop in Tarboro, North Carolina. They specialize in used rock, country, and soul and offer affordable vintage clothing and housewares. Do you have used records you want to sell? Country Feedback wants to buy them. Find us on Instagram at Country Feedback Vintage and Vinyl or head down east and visit our brick and mortar. All are welcome at this inclusive and family-friendly record shop in the country. Republica Unicornia Yarns. Handmade yarn and notions for the color obsessed. Made with love and some swearing in fabulous Atlanta, Georgia by head yarn wench Kathleen. Get ready for rainbows with a side of giving a damn. Republica Unicornia is all about making your own magic using small batch, responsibly sourced, hand-dyed yarns, and thoughtfully made notions. Slow fashion all the way down and discover the joy of creating your very own beautiful hand-knit, crocheted, or woven pieces. Find us on Instagram at republica underscore unicornia underscore yarns and at www.republicaunicornia.com. Picnic Wear, a slow fashion brand ethically made by hand from vintage and dead stock materials, most notably vintage towels. Founder Danny has worked in the industry as a fashion designer for over 10 years, but started Picnic Wear in response to her dissatisfaction with the industry's shortcomings. Picnic Wear recently moved to rural North Carolina, where all their sewing and accessories are now designed and cut, but the majority of their sewing is done by skilled garment workers in New York City. Their customers take comfort in knowing that all their sewists are paid well above New York City minimum wage. Picnic Wear offers minimal waste and maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Welcome to Close Horse, the podcast that is now officially based in dun, 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 Austin, Texas. That's right, everyone. I've been here for a few days, not even a full week. Don't don't ask me about moving. It's it's it was terrible, but I'm really excited to be here in Austin, and I can't wait to meet new people and put together some Close Horse IRL events here. You know, there's so much potential to grow the clothes horse community, and I'm ready to get down to work. Oh yeah, I'm your host, Amanda, and this is episode 112, the first episode of 2022, the first episode 
partially recorded here in Austin, Texas. Today's special guest is someone you've met before, Susan M. The M stands for Maximally Marvelous Massey. That's Susan M. Massey. Susan has called into the hotline before to share her stories of the vintage trade, so you may have heard those. And she also wrote an amazing essay for the now defunct world about her experience reporting her employer to OSHA. It's an amazing Amazing story. It will get you riled up. It will make you demand better from your employer. So I'll share that in the show notes. Please go read it if you haven't yet. Today, Susan is here to talk about her experiences managing a clinique counter at a department store in Berkeley. You get the best of multiple worlds with this conversation. You get the frustration of working retail. Check and the wastefulness of the beauty industry. Double check. Do people say that? Do people say double check? I'm saying it. Anyway, I've been saying for a long time that I want to talk more about the waste, the flim flammery, and the pointless consumerism of the beauty industry. And Susan is here to share some stories. If you work in the beauty industry and you have more to say, please reach out to me. I I want to hear from you so much, so badly. Seriously, drop me an email, send me a DM. Let's talk. Before we talk to Susan, and by the way, this is part one of our convo, we'll hear the final two small business audio essays from Old Flame Mending and Rabbit Person. Did you miss Close Horse for the last few weeks? Because I know I definitely missed making episodes, and I'm excited to be back here to work on it and There's so much in this episode to hear. Since the last time we recorded, so much has happened. I packed up all of my belongings, basically skipping Christmas, skipping New Year's, all all the festive things. I was packing, carrying, cleaning, being at least 50% unhappy. (laughs) We loaded up a big container of all of our furniture and our weird decor, our artificial fruit. Yes, I had three boxes of artificial fruit, and I'm not ashamed. So many boxes of vintage books, so much more. Don't even get me started on Dustin's audio and music equipment. We loaded it all up. It was terrible. I'm covered with bruises. One of my cacti gave me a rash on both arms, and my knee literally turned purple. Now it's more of a lavender. It's on the rebound is what I'm saying. (laughs) Next, after all of that, I drove a car full of plants for three days from Bird in Hand, Pennsylvania, where I lived, to Austin. And Brenda was my co-pilot. The other cats rode with Dustin, and we drove through Seriously, some of the most terrifying weather I've ever driven a car through, including a tornado alert somewhere in Tennessee, where I was told to immediately leave the road and find shelter. It was terrifying. I was like, how will I protect Brenda? I drank so much coffee. I ate an entire bag of ketchup flavored potato chips, five stars. Go get yourself your own bag. I'm pretty sure I didn't have a single vegetable for three days. There's one last detail of my move that I want to mention to all of you. Um, We kind of brought an extra cat along to Austin. (laughs) Yeah, I am. I really am a cat lady and I'm trying to just lean into it instead of feeling ashamed of my wild, unbridled love for animals. (laughs) Um, But her name is Janet. She's a teeny tiny little calico Uh, you know, I think I've mentioned here on the pod before and maybe I haven't, but I have been feeding a lot of stray cats in bird in hand and actually like everywhere I've lived, they find me. I don't know how it's like there's a tracking device or like they all have their own subreddit where they find and share people who will feed them. Anyway, first one cat showed up. We caught him blacky whitey. I've mentioned here he's sort of, or guess he was Hutch's arch nemesis. Then an orange cat appeared and, you know, other cats coming and going. Eventually Hutch showed up. And about three or four months ago, this little tiny calico cat began to appear. And I called her Janet because she was always yelling. And if you get that joke, then, you know, you're just as nerdy as me. So 
At first, Janet would just stand far away from me and yell at me, and I would just leave food out for her and run away, and then she would come and eat, and she was very timid. But one day, she just came up to me, and I was able to begin to pet her. And it sort of escalated, where then every time I went outside, she would appear, I'd have to sit down, hold her on my lap, pet her. Everyone who came over to our house, which there weren't that many people because, you know, we live in the middle of nowhere, or lived in the middle of nowhere, and, you know, it's a pandemic. Uh, but when they did, uh, they would have to also sit down and hold Janet and pet her. I mean, she's super sweet. And then it started to get cold, and I built a little bed using a lawn chair and a blanket. It's built would be an overstatement. I just, you know, put some stuff together and made it cozy for her. And she would lay there in the daytime, but then soon she was there 24 hours a day. And soon she was staring through the window at me, like she would climb over onto the windowsill of the bathroom and watch me in there at night as I was getting ready for bed. And soon she was just there 24 hours a day. So we were like, okay, we really need to find a place for this cat. Like, what are we going to do? You know, we're going to leave soon. And like, you know, we can't just leave her here starving and cold. Who will take care of her? I tried to get my in-laws to take her back to North Carolina. I tried to get my neighbors to take her. I tried to get Dylan and their partner, Ryan, to take her. That was almost close, and they still might eventually. But ultimately, no one could take Janet. And on Christmas Day, one of the other barn cats we've been feeding for a while, her name's Mandy Winger, was hit by a car and killed in front of our house on the road. And Dustin and I realized, we kind of just looked at each other, and we said... We're taking Janet with us to Austin. So I have another cat. Her name is Janet. I'll share a picture on Instagram. My name is Amanda Lee McCarty, and I have a lot of cats. (laughs) Thanks for letting me tell you all about this. (laughs) I kind of secretly love driving. I'm just going to tell you. You get a lot of time to listen to podcasts, to listen to music, and you get a lot of time alone to think about things. And this trip gave me the chance to think about my priorities and goals for Clothes Horse. You want to hear what they are? One is progress, not perfection, because it's the pursuit of perfection that sets us up for disappointment, frustration, and ultimately just giving up. And then guess what? Everything stays the same. The personal is political, Your stories help shape the values and actions of others. I want Close Horse to be a platform for voices from our community, voices that aren't often heard by everyone else. So I'm hoping to host some live talk show format episodes using stereo. More details to follow. It's an app. Go check it out. It's great because we can record it and release it as episodes, but then also all of you can drop by and ask questions and make comments. Doesn't that sound fun? I think it sounds fun. You know my dream, if you've been following long enough, has been to be like a 90s talk show host, so it gives me a little bit of that feeling. So stay tuned for that. We're hopefully going to do something like that in February. Um, what else? I'm going to be asking for a lot more audio essays. I just... I just love hearing from all of you, and I know you all love hearing one another, so let's do more of that. Next, this is a big one for me. Slow fashion is for everyone, and I've been talking about that a lot on Instagram, maybe talking about it a lot more around here. Every guest I have lined up for this year, I have asked them to talk about their thoughts on slow fashion for everyone and how we can make this community more accessible and welcoming, because We have a lot of work to do there. We want everyone involved, right? Next, small business is the future. I talk about this all the time, and I truly believe this. And I want to elevate more small businesses and share their stories and make shopping small second nature for everyone. Speaking of other things I'd like to make second nature for everyone, that's secondhand first. Because you know what? There's so much stuff in the world already. Let's let's help other people feel more confident and empowered to shop and gift secondhand. We're all already, we've all been converted by now, right? We love shopping secondhand. Let's get more people on board because yes, I know this sounds shocking to some of you, but some people, they don't know where to begin or there's a lot of stigma around it. We gotta, we gotta fix both those problems and we're gonna do that together. 
What else? Collaboration over competition. Can can we just ask this question? Why is there so little collaboration within the slow fashion and sustainability community? Let me tell you, there's very little and it's frustrating. I want Close Horse to be an agent of change. We need collective action, meaning all of us working together to change this world. And that means getting rid of competition and replacing that with collaboration and support. I'll be digging into all of these so much more over the next few episodes. So don't worry, we're going to talk about it so much. You're going to get sick of hearing about it. Stay tuned after my convo with Susan, where I'll talk about progress, not perfection, and some tips for kind of integrating that into your own journey. I just want to thank all of you. I'm going to thank you like 37 more times this month alone. Thank you so much for joining me on this wild ride. Making Clothes Horse has been a life changer for me, and I'm so grateful for all of your support and all the time you spend listening. I really believe that we're on the path to some major changes, and we're going to get there together. One of the most challenging categories of clothing in terms of sustainable options is athletic wear. Yet you you can't go out there and work out in a pair of jeans or you don't want to go for a hike or a long bike ride in a dress. Although, yes, I've done both of those. I have many regrets about it. Don't be like me. Wear athletic wear to do these things. Active wear isn't a nice to have It's a need to have, and shopping for it can be so difficult, especially if you're a sustainability-minded, secondhand first kind of person, which I know you are. There should be a more affordable and sustainable way to purchase premium athletic wear. Well, guess what? I found one, and it's Revive Athletics. Revive Athletics believes clothing should make you feel good when you move, and that starts with how you purchase it. Shopping secondhand is the most sustainable way to shop, and Revive Athletics is committed to providing high-quality, premium athletic wear so you can feel good when you shop and you can feel even better when you move. Everything Revive Athletics sells is very gently used, and they carry a wide variety of sizes from extra small to 5X, and they offer all of the premium brands you've been scoping out, like Lululemon, Nike, Athleta, Girlfriend Collective, you name it. And while a pair of Lululemon leggings would cost you around $100 if you purchase them new, at Revive, you won't pay over $35 a pair. You're getting really excited right now, aren't you? Revive will also buy your gently used athletic wear and athleisure no matter where you are, and they'll send you a prepaid label to ship items into them. By keeping your gently used items in circulation, you're helping to reduce their carbon footprint. And that, that my friends, is the hashtag secondhand first lifestyle right there. All items are carefully inspected and cleaned with Defunkify, an eco-friendly detergent made in Oregon. And I know you were wondering about that. Are you glad I told you? Revive Athletics is committed to building and supporting community. They offer classes in their space in Portland, Oregon, and they also donate items to Rose Haven, a Portland day shelter and community center serving women, children, and gender diverse people experiencing the trauma of abuse, loss of home, and other disruptive life challenges. What an incredible place to shop. I mean, I know you're sold now. You're like, tell me more, Amanda. How can I shop Revive Athletics. Well, if you're in one of my favorite cities, my former home, the place I think of as my hometown, Portland, Oregon, you can shop in person at their store, or you can go online at reviveathletics.com, no matter where you live. And even better, I have a special offer exclusively for members of the Clothes Horse community. Use promo code REVIVEIT15 to get 15% off your first purchase. And don't worry, I will include that in the show notes so you don't have to run and grab a pencil right now. 
The next time someone asks you where you got your athletic wear, you can tell them, thanks. It's revived. And know that you made the best decision and saved a heck of a lot of money too. Once again, that's reviveathletics.com. You can also find them on Instagram at revive underscore athletics. Go check it out. I think you're going to love what you see. Okay, let's listen to our last two small business audio essays from Old Flame Mending and rabbit person. As a reminder, these are not, and that's capital N-O-T, not ads. They are real small businesses in our community talking about what they do, why they do it, and hopefully inspiring all of you to both shop small and I don't know, maybe start a small business of your own because this, this is how we make some serious change in the world. It all starts with us. Hey, it's Rebecca from Old Flame Mending. We've been featured on this podcast before, and a big thanks to Amanda for wanting to showcase small businesses during the holiday season. Our business, Old Flame Mending, is a sewing service that uses clothing repair as well as tailoring and alterations to keep your clothes in your closet and out of the landfill. We have mended over a thousand garments so far, and while that's just a drop in the bucket compared to the enormity of textile waste, we're happy to help our customers live more sustainably through our services. Hi there, I'm Tia from Old Flame Mending. I primarily mend denim, darn sweaters, repair quilts, and plush animals. I find mending important because it rejects the idea that newer is better and embraces imperfections on our favorite garments. My favorite takeaway from this business is how every day feels like a new adventure. One day I'm darning a sock and the next I'm repairing a 100 year old denim skirt. This actually happened. I think my favorite thing about running our business is connecting with our clients in a meaningful way. A lot of our clients are passionate about combating waste, and we also get to hear stories about specific garments. Sometimes those stories involve loving memories of an ancestor who sewed, or sometimes the stories are more humorous, like the time this one client came in to us with a pair of pants that ripped while they were busting a move at their best friend's wedding reception. I do most of the tailoring fittings, so making people feel more comfortable in their clothing is really rewarding for me too. Whether they're looking for a perfect length in a pair of vintage jeans they just bought, or if they're seeking a fit in a shirt that better matches their gender expression. I like how this business challenges me creatively. Our slogan is, we'll fix anything but a broken heart. And that brings in various textiles and challenges us how to mend them. I enjoy shopping secondhand and local whenever possible to further grow a sustainable business. The most challenging part for me about running our business in particular is competing with the prices of fast fashion. Sometimes a mend on a garment actually ends up costing more than what someone paid for the garment itself at H&M or Forever 21 or wherever else they got it. Um, So we really have to advocate for ourselves sometimes to create the value of mending and tailoring. Another challenge we faced starting out was building our operations structure. How can we make this work? Everything from a price guide to our terms and conditions sheet we have our client sign to how we process intake was all new. Since our business is so unique, we didn't have a framework to copy, but rather pieced one together, looking at how alteration shop operate, help from our other friends who sew, to speaking with a small business lawyer about legalities. We started in 2019, and Pittsburgh has been supportive of our mending dreams ever since. I'm proud we found a way to combat textile waste in our community while supporting other small businesses along the way. Out-of-town listeners who would like their clothes mended by us can do so by mail, and instructions to do so are on our website, www.oldflamemending.com. Our Instagram is at Old Flame Mending. Thank you. Mm-hmm. 
Hello, my name is Anna, aka Rabbit Person. You may have seen my illustrations for the Close Horse blog in the past. Just to explain the name, I have three rescued rabbits and I volunteer in the rabbit shelter for about three years now. I am an illustrator and a graphic designer by education. Uh, last year, after making a few handmade books for my daughter, basically out of garbage that I found around the house, I decided it's time to write, illustrate, design, and publish a real children's book. Um, as I was writing it, I realized that I can't possibly touch on all the topics I want in just one picture book, so I decided to create a book series. I called it Witchwood Stories after the place where the main characters live. At the moment, there is one book already available, and a second one is going to be released in the beginning of February. It is a picture book, but with a fair amount of text. I made it this way for my daughter, basically, because this is the level that uh, she's at at the moment. It is about two girls. Well, at least the first one is. Um, one of whom has a physical disability and another one is um, neurodivergent. My objective is to create stories that cultivate a sense of wonder and respect for the natural world, as well as for people's differences. I try to make it an interesting story based on what my daughter likes to read about. It sometimes have hard time, I think, accepting each other's differences and how they're not exactly the same. And um, I, I hope that the stories can help them maybe in this journey to accept each other and be kinder to each other. At least that's my hope. You can find me on Instagram under rabbit.person or witchwood.stories. Um, that second account is dedicated completely to the books. So if you want to see illustrations, learn more about characters and stay informed on upcoming books, follow that one. Um, Rabbit Person is my um, personal Instagram account, which you're also very welcome to follow. Um, I will be very glad. Weren't those great? Thank you again to everyone who has submitted their audio essays for this series. I'll just say, as a person who writes and records themselves talking all the time, I know how difficult it is. And it's it's a really vulnerable act because, well, it's weird to hear yourself recorded, to put your voice out there for a bunch of strangers, to hope that no one snarks about the way you speak or the sound of your voice or they might think your ideas are dumb. It's really scary. So I'm super grateful and super proud of the essays that everyone contributed for this round. And I hope it's inspiring you, yes you, to consider sending in your own essay. And that makes this a great time to remind you that the deadline is approaching for the next round of audio essays. And I'm sad to say, sad, my friends, I've only received one so far. So get on it. This round is inspired by the great resignation, i.e. this year's phenomenon of many people quitting their jobs. I think we're all doing a lot of reevaluation around work and its role in our life. I love it. I'm here for it. And we're finally demanding better working conditions and wages from our employers. Conversely, it's not easy to quit a job. It's just not. It's scary and it often requires a financial safety net that many of us do not have. I remember a friend telling me years ago, if you hate your job, just quit it, as if it was the most obvious solution in the world. I was a single parent living paycheck to paycheck. I couldn't just quit my shitty job, no matter how mean my boss was or how draconian the policies were, how abusive the environment was. It's a complicated topic, right? And I want us to talk about it. Tell us about the time you quit a job. What finally made you do it? How did you feel? What happened next? Did you start a new project? Did it improve your mental and physical health? Maybe it didn't. I don't know. You have to tell us. What is your advice 
for others who might be on the verge of making the same decision for themselves. I'll share all of the other details for contributing in the show notes, so check it out. The deadline is January 15th, which is coming very soon. So soon. So check out those details and get to recording. The most powerful thing that has happened for me since beginning my work on Close Horse is meeting all of you and seeing this community build around us. It means so much to me. And honestly, like I I just said probably five minutes ago, it's changed my life for the good. All of you have kept me going when I did not think that I could. And that that is beyond important. Important is a word that doesn't even capture the true power of all of you in my life. This community is so important. I'm constantly thinking of ways to empower all of us to hear everyone's stories and to build relationships because I really believe that that is how we mobilize one another. And that's what these audio essays are all about. If you have a suggestion for a future audio essay topic, hit me up. I want to hear all about it. I want to keep this going. All right. Well, are you ready to jump into my conversation with Susan M. Massey? This week, I asked all of you on Instagram, what is a beauty or cosmetic product you've given up because it feels just too wasteful, too pointless, maybe just not that useful to you in this day and age? And I received a lot of great answers that actually made me feel so excited about how thoughtful our community is. A lot of you said that you gave up cotton pads and cotton balls in favor of reusable pads. I've done this too. And Honestly, it's kind of one of the easiest, more sustainable changes you can make. It's so easy (laughs) and not disappointing. I actually have some great ones that I bought from Grove Collaborative, and they're, they're pretty basic, but there are a lot of makers out there offering way cuter ones, often from upcycled materials. Danny of Picnic Wear, for example, offers super cute ones made from vintage towel scraps. So if you're looking to make a small change this this is a start. This one is not as difficult as, say, switching to bar shampoo, which has more of a learning curve, right? What else have we all given up? Well, a lot of us gave up liquid soap and shower gel. Yes, this is another one that is way easier than you think it's going to be. Dustin and I fully made that switch a few years ago. You know, he was one of those Dr. Bronner's kinds of guys, you know, but that's a big plastic bottle, right? And I, I don't know, I was never committed to any specific bathing product, but I was always trying something new and inevitably it was in a plastic bottle. It's so nice to have less plastic waste. And, you know, we also at the same time gave up bottled shampoo and conditioner, which like I said, a bit of a learning curve, maybe you're not there yet, but We finally did it and it won us back some space in the shower and it cut down on our plastic consumption quite a bit because we both have a lot of hair to deal with. We're we're a house of long hairs here. But back to liquid soap, I've actually found that bar soap, and this kind of surprised me, lasts longer and is less expensive as long as you're caring for it, right? You can't let it sit in a puddle of water because then your soap goes away very, very fast. I use a cotton mesh pouch with my soap that makes it last longer and foam up even more. And I don't know if the foam really does something, but psychologically, it makes me feel like I'm really getting some work down there. You put the soap in the mesh pouch, you pull a drawstring, and voila, soap magically lasts forever. Like it almost reaches a point where you're like, ah, oh, I'm kind of bored with the soap, but I still have half a bar left. I got to see it through to the end. I don't know how it works but I recommend it very highly. I also just want to give a shout out to the fr- a friend of the pod and a former guest, Vellum Street Soap Company, who makes my favorite bar soap. It's oily and it's moisturizing. And so it actually works for me to use for shaving as well, which means I don't have to buy any kind of shaving cream. So there's one more product that's not coming into my house and ending up in the recycling bin where it really won't get recycled, right? And it saves money. Yeah, to be honest, when you look in my shower, there's just not much to see. Just 
all kinds of bars of different colors in different mesh pouches or on different soap dishes. It's kind of weird. I like it. Um, The other common thread I saw in all of your Instagram responses was that the pandemic made you realize that there were a lot of products that you were using that you don't actually need from foundation to primer. I never got that one anyway, to setting spray. That's another one that scares me, maybe because I'm afraid it's going to get in my contacts. I don't know. Tons of hairstyling products. I mean, you all had a lot of really good call outs there. And I will agree, I'm in the same boat. You know, I stopped wearing foundation after basically feeling like my whole life that I was supposed to, that that was a thing we were supposed to do if we were going to go to work or go on a date or go out or leave the house in general. Well, I stopped wearing foundation back in 2020 and I still can't believe this, or maybe I can. My skin is so great now that I don't actually need foundation and I question if I ever needed it. And I'm just throwing this out there, perhaps my use of foundation was perpetuating a need for foundation. I don't know. The last category of products we've given up are impulse purchases. This is one I know all too well. You know, things that we bought that we never fully used and we kind of just collected, perhaps even hoarded from nail polish. Yep, I was once guilty there. To lipsticks, just ask me about the mason jar of lip glosses I moved around the country for about 10 years, but never actually wore. Side note, I only have one lipstick now. I totally love it. It's from a brand called Axiology and it's zero waste. Go check them out. Also, made here in the US. Uh, the company is owned by women of color. It's badass. It's really cool. Anyway, <laughs> this is not an ad for them. They don't even know who I am. I just wanted to put that out there as something that felt like a real victory for me. Um, what else? A lot of us are giving up hoarding eyeshadows. That's true. And the palettes, Susan and I are going to talk about this, but like, have you ever actually used an entire palette of eyeshadow? I haven't. There's always like one or two colors that I love and the rest just sit around taking up space in my life. And all that packaging for that stuff is just so wasteful. We were all just buying stuff we never used just because it was fun. Maybe because it was an affordable treat. I mean, I think I've talked about this before, but way back in the day when I would work at my horrible retail job and work until really late at night, I would stop at this 24-hour Walgreens and just walk through the aisles and buy, buy something cheap and fun because it made me feel just a little bit better, at least temporarily. That's how I ended up with that mason jar of lip glosses, by the way. I also think that these beauty products, these cosmetics, whatever it is, whether it's soap to eyeliner to lotion to conditioner, whatever, it offers us hope for a better life, a better day, a better us, thanks to that one small purchase. And it's really similar to fast fashion that way. We always want to believe that this thing, whether it's a blouse or a glittery eyeshadow, will be the ticket to, you know, happiness. And guess what? It just really isn't. The cosmetics industry sells us a ton of false hope, probably a ton more than fast fashion ever has, because this lotion or that eyeliner or this hair color will guarantee youth, beauty, and all of the romantic and social success attached to youth and beauty. Well, allegedly attached to that. I would love for us to cut that one off too. Let's get to work on that. It's a hard pill to swallow when you step back, right? Because some of us, myself included, have been swimming in this sea of beauty and cosmetics since at least, since at least middle school. Heck, I'm just going to go ahead and say elementary school, When you consider all of the lip smackers and Love's Baby Soft and Tinkerbell nail polish that was being sent our way, Barbie makeup, makeup for Barbie, Barbie brand makeup for us, makeup, 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 soaps, even Mr. Bubble, even Innocent Mr. Bubble, another product that was supposed to make us better somehow. 
The beauty, skincare, cosmetics, personal care industry, whatever you want to call it, is an area of overconsumption, waste, and rampant greenwashing. So much of it. Gosh, their use of the word natural alone is scandalous. And none of this gets the same kind of attention as the fast fashion industry, but it's a 500 billion with a B dollar business, meaning $500 billion worth of products sold every year, most of it packaged in plastic. In fact, the industry spends $25 billion each year on packaging alone. And you know what? 70% of that ends up in landfills. The other 25% is either probably jammed in a closet in our apartment or our home. It's in a mason jar that we keep toting around the country. Or maybe, miraculously, it did get recycled. Much like fast fashion, the very competitive personal care industry relies on selling us as much stuff as often as possible aka overconsumption. Cosmetics brands have adopted the fast fashion model of launching new products and collabs and collections week after week after week. Instagram trends and tutorials on YouTube have fueled this machine and it's only increased our desire for new, new, new. After all, we want that promise of a better us. Beauty is such a big industry that even fast fashion brands like H&M, Zara, and Forever 21, and Urban Outfitters, all of them, they have seen the profitability of selling makeup, fragrance, and skincare, so they've been creating their own products to sell in stores. In fact, before Forever 21 declared bankruptcy, they'd actually been rolling out a chain of their own beauty stores called Riley Rose. Um, Since the bankruptcy, they've sort of absorbed Riley Rose in as a house brand that they sell in their stores, and they've closed all the freestanding Riley Rose stores. But I mean, even Forever 21 was like, beauty is such a cash cow that we're going to open our own stores. And that's, that's how it is. I mean, Ulta and Sephora are everywhere. Target has been expanding its beauty department. There are so many brands selling on Instagram day after day after day. There's like a new brand I get an ad for every single day, I swear. And of course, blogs, influencers, and magazines are here to remind us to buy new stuff every single week from all of these different places that are offering us new stuff every single week. You know, we've been sold this idea that we must use a specific array of products in order to be successful socially, professionally, and romantic and romantically, whether it's something to remove our body hair or something to thicken up the hair that's on our head, whether it's primer or setting spray or many shades of eyeshadow, all kinds of fragrances for every part of our body. We are told that we could never be our best selves without repeatedly purchasing and using a cabinet of products. And you know what? It's just not true. That said, I'm not here to guilt you for your complex skincare regimen, because guess what? I have one of my own. I'm going to be honest, when I posted that question on Instagram, a lot of people, I got a lot of people who were sort of like, I don't wear anything, and it's the best way to go, and I gave it all up, and if you haven't, you're kind of dumb, and that's not what I'm here for, right? I'm not here to hear that. You're not here to hear that. It's all about buying what we're actually going to use and using it all before we buy more. That's the ticket, right? Not buying more than we can use, not buying things that we just sit on a shelf so we can take that perfect hashtag shelfie. It's okay to feel your best with eyeliner or perfume, but I do want us to be mindful of our consumption here. Like I said, it's an interesting dichotomy that this industry sells us. This thing will make you better, more successful, more popular. And at the same time, this magical product that can do all of these things, it's a temporary thing that will have to be replaced in just a few weeks or months. Hmm. Except the catch is, which they don't tell you, I guess this is the second catch because we already learned this magical thing actually will have to be replaced really soon by an even better magical thing. The other catch is that none of this stuff is disposable 
And it all has a massive impact on the planet and its people from its production to its end life in landfills. And we'll be talking about that more in the next episode. But already you can see that we need to be talking about this industry. And I'm excited to get that conversation started today. So without further ado, let's jump into my conversation with Susan. Susan, why don't you introduce yourself to everyone? Hi, I'm Susan Massey. Uh, I am a vintage clothing dealer these days, uh, but I was a counter manager uh, of a Clinique counter at a small department store in the East Bay for almost 10 years. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Yeah. I mean, I, I when I heard it was Clinique, I got really excited because this was like the prestige brand <laughs> of my teenage years in a pre-Sephora world, like getting to go to the Bonton or Macy's and get like your Clinique free gift was the ultimate sign that you had arrived as, I don't know, middle class. I'm not really sure. Um, but I remember thinking Clinique was so fancy. Oh, yeah, me too. I actually grew up using Clinique products. My mom, um, you know, my mom and I still use Clinique, but she's been, um, the brand has been around since 1968. And wow. she started using it back then, like when she and my dad were dating, going all the way back, you know, to the beginning. So she was really excited um, that I got hired there. And when I, you know, when I saw that job opening for a, a counter manager at a small department store in Berkeley, I was like, Oh, Clinique, I love Clinique, you know, <laughs> um, I, I grew up in the Detroit area and our two stores where we would get our Clinique products are now long gone, unfortunately, but there were two department stores. Uh, one was Hudson's and one was Crowley's. So that's where mm. we would go for our you know, the the free gift with purchase and, you know, whenever my mother needed a refill of her uh, dramatically different moisturizing lotion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Black Honey. That was a Black Honey Almost Lipstick. That was a big deal. That's a good one, though. That one is classic. Yeah. You know, I bought one of those a couple years ago, like, just in a fit of nostalgia. And I, I, I was like, wow, this is still an amazing product, actually. It yeah, looks so I still, good. to this day, I, I mostly use Clinique products. I still, you know, I really like them. Um, some things have changed over the years, and we can get into that, definitely. But um, overall, I, you know, I've been using using the products since I was probably about 12 or 13 you know, the, the three-step skincare was always, you know, w always a big deal. My mom took me into Hudson's when I was about uh, 13 and got me skin typed and got me my first three-step system. And, you know, so I've, I've been loyal to the brand even long before I worked there. And, you know, all these years later after, you know, after departing <laughs> that position, <laughs> that counter. <laughs> I mean, that says something about that, like, you know, the products are good, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are plenty of places I've worked where I wouldn't touch their clothes oh at this my point. Goodness, yeah. So, yeah, that definitely <laughs> means something. So, okay, well, let's just jump right in. You know, I didn't ask you this when we were preparing for this, but I just need to know, what is your stance on Clinique Happy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> you know, you I, never, I never wore it until I started working there. And then uh -huh. like, um, we had like a dress code for, I would say like a dress code for our face. You know, we definitely had a uniform oh, that we had to wear and I can uh -huh. get into that in, in, you know, a few minutes if you'd like. Um, but we had to, we had a dress code for our face with, uh, the makeup that we had to wear. And we also were not allowed to wear any fragrances other than Clinique. So I wow. had always been, you know, the type to wear like, you know, uh, like sandalwood oil or whatever, you know, I didn't, I wasn't really into perfumes so much. Um, I would use different perfumes here and there over the course of years, but not, you know, my go-to was kind of like scented oils and, and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, well, I can't, you know, can't wear that at this job and that's fine. And then I started spritzing myself with happy when I got to work and I was like, you know, I kind of like this it's really fresh and citrusy and it, it grew on me. And then I really liked happy and bloom, which um, would come out once a year in springtime. And I still have, I should probably get rid of it at this point. I still have like half a bottle of that sitting on my dresser that I haven't worn. <laughs> <laughs> so happy, like I, 
wasn't wild about it at first, but it grew on me, maybe because I was smelling it every day. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting. Like, I remember the first time I smelled it as a teenager, I was really into it. But I think if I smelled it now, I'd probably have a headache. I I think most perfumes now, like department store perfumes, are just too much for me. And then um, fragrance was always a really hard sell in Berkeley. Uh, that makes total sense to me. Yeah. yeah. Yep. All adds up. I could I could see that. So was there a lot of pressure to sell these things, like fragrance, but also the makeup? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everything. The uh, skincare, makeup, fragrance, all of it. You know, and when I, when I first started in 2007 and I went to my first three-day training – um, for new consultants. Uh, I remember the trainer, her name, she was great. Her name was Stephanie and she was my main trainer all the way through the whole, you know, almost decade that I worked for the company. And I, I really liked her. Um, the trainings were kind of funny because they, I would describe them as a cross between like your standard corporate training session, you know, for the day. And, a bridal shower. <laughs> you know, because okay. she would have us she would have us do games and things like that, which were really it sounds hokey, but it was really fun. You know, yeah. we would get to pick stuff out of the treat box. And I don't know, it just she just was really good at like giving us a lot of information, but making making it easy for us to um to really grasp onto it and not feel overwhelmed. Um, But I remember from that very first training session when she was talking about how we all would develop our own style of sales. And Mm -hmm. um, she said, oh, Clinique is not a high pressure sell. We don't do that to people. And I remember thinking, oh, wow, that's great to hear because I'm not I'm not good at that. I like to keep things open ended. And then Mm -hmm. over the years, it just got more and more and more towards the high pressure end of it. Uh, And it, that never feels good to me. You know, I like to leave things open-ended. I would write things down for people. I would get, you know, make little samples for, for customers if they weren't sure. And I would say, you know, try this out for three days or five days or whatever. And, um, we had these little dramming jars for foundation. And then you had like a little sticker label you could attach to the top to write down uh, the foundation color. But I like any type of skincare product, anything that was creamy, I would put in the, the little dram jar and let someone take it home and say, you know, see how you like this. Um, how you're able to fit it into your, for example, your nighttime skincare routine or morning or you know, whatever, and then bring the jar back. So we'll know what it is. And, you know, if you decide to buy it, then great. If, if it doesn't work out for you, um, and you'd like to try something else, you know, come on back and and we'll figure that out. And Mm -hmm. a lot of people would come back and purchase the product and they'd say, Oh, thanks for not, you know, um, strong arming me into buying this, (laughs) you know, (laughs) because it was a very neighborhoody store. You know, it wasn't, right. like a, it wasn't a great big Macy's department store, so, you know, somewhere like that. Um, but my account executive was always on me about doing high, pre- you know, really pressuring people into buying stuff. And I just, I never, f- I grew up very working class, so I never felt good about that. Yeah. I mean, I could, I couldn't do it. Like that is th- the last job I could do. Like, did you, did you work on a commission or did you just have these like goals you had to meet? Like, how did it work? It was both. I um, I would get, I think it was three or four percent of whatever I sold. So the so that was the commission. So the in addition to my hourly pay. So the commission was somewhat of a motivator, but you know, in all honesty, three percent is not or four percent, whatever it was. Either way, it's not very not very juicy. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's not really. <laughs> you got to sell a lot of black honey. Oh my god! Yeah, you do. You have to sell a lot of the dramatically different moisturizing lotion. <laughs> <laughs> gallons buckets you know? seriously right I mean I always wondered about that because like at Sephora I don't think people make a commission right no. they're just paid hourly and there is a difference in the experience there as a customer yeah. I think yeah definitely I mean I was paid hourly and then we did have goals we had monthly goals weekly goals daily goals and the daily goal was you wanted to beat whatever you did the year before on that date 
Mm-hmm. Classic. So w- the store manager, when she hired me, she was telling me about um, the commission and, and, you know, everything else. And she said, oh, but we have $2,000 days all the time. Well, that was BS. <laughs> By 2007, they were not having $2,000 days at that store unless they were in gift. And um, something that the store manager would always bring up were numbers from when they first put the counter in the store back in the 90s. And I remember at one point I asked her, I said, was that before there, the internet existed? And she, well, yeah, but that shouldn't make a difference. I said, come on, it makes a huge difference. You know. Um, yeah. I mean, I, that was the next question I was going to ask you. So you worked at a time like, you know, we've got Sephora starting to arrive on right. the scene. We've got the internet. We've got mm-hmm. makeup trends on social media and all these Instagram makeup yes. brands. What was that shift like? Like, what was it like before and what was it like after? Well, something that I found really frustrating um, was that we had, you know, we had all those outlets that you mentioned. Also, Clinique, it was a big deal um, when Clinique would be featured on QVC. Oh, and I didn't even think of that. I think we forget about QVC and what a big deal that was for a long time. Mm -hmm, Um, mm Mm-hmm. But I remember chatting with my dad about it, and he had been in sales for years, too. And he said, it's almost like they're competing with themselves, like they're just overdoing it. Yeah, I agree. You know. It's really weird. What were they thinking? I guess they thought they were going to reach people who didn't want to go to a store. But it is like, I, I was wondering if you maybe started to see a change in the customer, like in terms of age, as you know, Sephora moved onto the scene and like you could buy tons of makeup online. Like, did you feel like you were shifting into an older customer? Our, um, our customer base, one of the things I really liked about the job was that our customer base was pretty varied. Um, Mm -hmm. of course, like we were right across the street from the UC Berkeley campus. Um, so it was a good opportunity. You know, it was, it was a really good location. Um, to definitely sell to the college students. And I think like um, really quick. So we were part of a, a local East Bay chain of stores called McCullough's and some of the other McCullough's had cosmetic counters as well. They would have um, Clinique and then Estee Lauder and Lancome. And when they uh, put the counter, the Clinique counter in uh, Bancroft initially in the nineties, they decided to just do Clinique because they were hoping to like, primarily serve the student, you know, the students at UC Berkeley. And they felt that Estee Lauder was too, too old of a brand and Lancome had too high of a price point. Mm. But the thing about Clinique is that anybody can use it. It's very, it's a, one of the things I like about the brand is that it's pretty, it's pretty universal. And so we did have, I did have a lot of students from UC Berkeley. Um, and, but my favorite customers were the women that worked at the campus. And I got to see just how many people it takes to keep a university up and running. But a lot of the women that worked in admin and, you know, every aspect you can imagine of university staff, um, they were a little bit older and they were some of my absolute favorite customers because they loved the fact that they could run over on their lunch break and grab whatever they needed. And I had mm-hmm. like a, a customer book. So I would fill out a page for them. And, and you know, they, if they couldn't remember what foundation they had last time that worked so well for them, I had it written down. And so they, they loved that. They loved the convenience. And I remember one woman, she says, I just, she said, I love the fact that you're here and that you always know what I need. And I don't have to go all the way to Macy's because I hate them all. And <laughs> <laughs> so that was always good to hear. Um, one thing I did notice with the UC Berkeley students was over the years as makeup tutorials on YouTube got really popular kind of in the late aughts, early 2010s. Mm-hmm. Um, and then makeup blogs got to be really popular too. A lot of them would come in acting like they already knew everything. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right to me. <laughs> And it was, you know, well, I need something to do a cut crease and, you know, I need this, that, and the other. And it was like, okay, well, let me show you what we have. And they're like, well, I guess I need to go to Sephora because you don't, and I'm just like, okay, you know, 
<laughs> yeah, I could I could see that. I mean, I think definitely like the entire i the entire industry of beauty has changed during since since the aughts in the same way that clothing did. Like I always think about like yes. fast makeup. Like there are so many brands that sell on like I mean they don't sell on Instagram but they have a strong Instagram presence like I think of there's this one brand ColourPop and I yes, swear yeah. they launch like three collabs every week like it's just so excessive mm-hmm. like the trend chasing and the constant newness and like I I get anxious thinking about all the plastic and stuff yeah. I used to love, like, in high school, I would go to the Rite Aid near my house, and it would be really exciting, like, that first week of the month because they would get new displays of things in, like, from Revlon and L'Oreal and all of those, you know, like, whatever the hot new makeup thing was going to be for that month. And, I mean, it, it just wasn't something that was happening every day or, you know, every week. And I see how much like clothing has blown up and there's just constant new trends being thrown our way. It's the same thing with makeup, like repackaging the same idea again and again. Like there's only so many shades of pink eyeshadow out there. Yes. You know, well, we would get palettes, um, like seasonal palettes, you know, of eyeshadow or, you know, it would be eyeshadow and blush or whatever we would get. They were like special, you know, um, special edition palettes for whatever season or holiday. And a lot of times it would be eyeshadows that were, you know, we would have like our regular eyeshadow quads or duos or whatever, and it would be one color from there and then another color from a different palette that already existed. And it would just... So it was kind of nice if you wanted like, okay, this winter palette is really beautiful and it's got all the colors I need for the next, you know, year or six months or whatever. But if you're somebody that's been buying eyeshadow or blush or whatnot from us for years, it's like, well, you probably already have this stuff, you know, in your makeup case at home. (laughs) Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I I I mean, I don't know how anybody else feels about this, but I am anti-palette at this point because I always use one or two colors and then the rest of it gets wasted. Yeah. That's always what happens, yes. right? And it's, it's like all this packaging yep. and nobody wants your used palette. So even if I'm like, I used all the colors I want, I haven't touched the other ones, no one wants that. Right. I feel like it's so wasteful. <laughs> The only good thing is that powders, if especially if you're the only one using them, they don't really go bad. That's good because I've had this Kat Von D palette for like seven years now. <laughs> it just travels across the country with me. <laughs> <laughs> My guess is it's probably fine if it doesn't feel like dusty and crumbly to you, then it it's probably fine if no one else is using it. Um, and you can, you can clean them up too. You can just take a cotton ball and, you know, swipe it over the top. And I mean, that's how we, that's how we kept everything clean, you know, on the tester uh-huh. units. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and the thing is, is that if someone is wearing makeup every day, most of the time they are not going to be wearing like the vibrant purple eyeshadow, <laughs> sparkly, you know, sparkly turquoise eyeshadow to work every day. I mean, some people do, right. you know, cause they're like, I don't care. I'm, you know, I love this color. I'm wearing it, but you know, most people, they want to, most people need something practical for every day. So, and I feel like a lot of the really trendy, uh, cosmetics lines, they're, you know, they have like the really bold, bright colors that for most people are just not practical. Um, they're fun and they're fun to look at, but they're not necessarily something that, you know, let's say you work for an insurance company. You probably don't want to go in with like a sparkly jade. <laughs> I don't know. I'd buy insurance from that person for sure. But yeah, I agree. Yeah, I probably would too, you know. But- <laughs> that would be like a selling point for me. But yeah, I, I agree. I feel like these palettes just end up sort of, I mean, what they really are is just a motivation to buy something, right? And it's like a higher right, price right. point than buying just one single eyeshadow. So it it benefits the brands a lot. I just, I would love to do a survey of everyone in the clothes horse community. Maybe I'll do this on Instagram. Like, have you ever successfully used an entire palette? I will say that I have, but that's because I was wearing, you know, I was required to wear makeup every single day. Like the dress code that we had for our face, if I could go over that really quick, it was. Yeah, tell me about it. 
so you had to wear a foundation or a tinted moisturizer. Um, concealer was optional if you needed it. Then you'd have to wear some type of powder on top of that. And then a cheek color. And then at least two shades of eyeshadow. And um, eyeliner, mascara, uh-huh. and then some type of lip color. Wow. Yeah. And the thing is, when I was working there, it just, it was so automatic for me to do my makeup every day. And I, and like, sometimes if we got new colors in or whatever of like, let's say eyeshadow lip color, I would, um, I would try to get to work a little early and, you know, use whatever we had on the tester unit. They also gave us uh gratis. I think it was three times a year. And I want to say it was like two, 260 or 240. or $260 each time to, so that we wouldn't have to, you know, we weren't having to shell out money every time we needed to buy something, you know, we, we would get, Mm -hmm. we would go on to a special website and get our gratis, which was really cool. And then they would give us a lot of times they would send us full size, um, skincare products or whatever, like when they were new and coming out. And if it was something that, um, we ourselves did not need to use, we were encouraged to give it to a friend or family member and then get feedback from them about how it was working. So my mother loved that. (laughs) (laughs) I bet. I bet. Anything anti-aging or, you know, all the repair wear, I would send it to her. And then, you know, a week later she'd be like, well, I like it, but I got a little in my eye and it really burned, but that's because I'm clumsy. (laughs) (laughs) Important feedback yeah for sure. will burn eye if yeah. <laughs> if inserted yeah. got it got it yeah it adds up it adds up I mean I that was gonna be one of my questions like how much free stuff did you get because like that seems like a major perk of the job although maybe I don't know do you get burned out on makeup after a while I'm not really sure I've Tell me, tell me all about it. Honestly, I loved the freebies. And then when we would go to training, we would get, you know, we would get freebies. And then, like I say, she would have the little, you know, Stephanie, the trainer would have the little games. And a lot of times we would get something, you know, we could win a prize, which, you know, would be like, you'd pick something out of a box and there would be all kinds of stuff in there. And, you know, so I really loved, I really loved that perk. That was, (laughs) that was pretty great. Um, Also, like, the uniform we had to wear, a lot of people didn't like that about um, mm-hmm. about the job. I didn't mind it. Uh, and when we had training, they, they explained, you know, why the uniform is, you know, was what it was. I don't know if it has changed or not, but we all know Clinique is the white lab coat. Right, right. Yeah. So it was the white lab coat. They supplied um they supplied us with the lab coats. We had to wash them and and they would get they would get really dirty and funky, believe it or not. You know? Anything white <laughs> is kind of like not you know, I, I don't think I've worn anything solid white since I quit there. Um so they supplied us with the lab coat, um, which was you know, really nice that we didn't have to pay for it. And then underneath you had to wear all black, either a short sleeve top or long sleeve. And you could just wear like a t-shirt. They didn't want you to wear anything like a blouse that buttoned up the front. And it had to have like a scoop neck or a mock turtleneck um, or a round crew neck. And then either um, black pants or a black skirt. And then, uh, you know, whatever type of shoes you weren't supposed to wear anything like open toed or sling back. And, you know, they discouraged from things like platform shoes. Um, I always wore for years. I wore skirts with, and you could wear um, solid tights, nylons, which who wears nylons anymore, but. uh, Oh my gosh, seriously. Or you could wear fishnets either. Oh, wow. Okay. So my, my personal uniform that I always wore was, you know, during the winter I had, I would go to target and buy them like by four at a time. I would get black long sleeve t-shirts, um, that were kind of fitted. And I had a, you know, a couple different skirts that I would wear just straight pencil skirts that were comfortable and then fishnets. And then I always wore dance go Mary Jane's. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or Doc Martin Mary Jane's towards the last few years. So it was like comfortable footwear. It looked nice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and then your nails for the longest time, we could only wear pink nude or classic red uh, nail polish, or we could have a French, like French tip manicure. 
Um, then Clinique started doing nail polishes again. So then we could just, you know, once they started having nail polish in all different colors, then they kind of opened that up. But we were not supposed to have long nails. <sighs> that makes sense. I mean, because, yeah. I mean, to be fair, like Clinique is all about trying to be like, I don't know, like sterile, scientific, you know, and that would seem unclean. Probably like longer nails might be dirtier. Right. And we're touching people's faces a lot too. Yeah. Yeah. That that makes sense to me. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I don't like having long nails personally. So, um, so for me, it wasn't a problem. I just remember like colleagues at other counters getting in trouble because they would have like big, like dark purple acrylics or whatever. And it- <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah the uniform I didn't mind like all of that all of that was fine you know I liked the fact that I didn't have to think about what I was going to wear to work and I'd had so many other jobs where we had to wear like hideous uniforms like I worked in social work for years and I would have to, <laughs> I would have to work at places where we have to wear like the company polo shirt and a pair of khakis oh and, yeah 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 po- company, you know agency polo shirts that we paid you know that came out of our paycheck you know that, uh. yeah <laughs> I hate that. I see so, so angry. Yeah, I will take my long sleeve, like, you know, my long sleeve black t shirt and fishnets over that any day, you know? <laughs> totally, totally. Well, so, like, what didn't you like about this job? Like, what, what was the hardest part of it? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> so, the way things were done was that you were, you were a clinic representative. But you were employed through whatever department store you worked for. Interesting. Okay. So you had to, so you had, you know, kind of like the rules and like, you know, everything with Clinique, like the uniform and whatnot. But then you also had like all the rules of your department store and you got paid through your department store. And my pay was not, not even, I won't even say it was good. It was pretty bad. And, um, when I first started for the first several years that I worked there, they didn't provide us with insurance. Oh, this is like a pre affordable care act era. Like that is so messed up. Yeah. Once that went through, we all got insurance. Like those of us that were there full time got insurance and then they stopped hiring people full time for the most part too. So it was like, of course. And then made us, made us think like, you know, told us like, Oh, well you're lucky that, you know, that you get insurance. I was like, I'm not lucky. I've been working for you for how long? Yeah. Um, Oh my God. Yeah. So that was really frustrating. Um, Also I, at my, our department store was part of an, of a group called the fashion group. So we were not like the big department stores, the big heavy hitters like Macy's and Nordstrom's. Um, We were like a subgroup. And Mm -hmm. so our account executive, she had us, which is McCullough's. And then she had like the PXs um, on like naval bases in the area. Mm -hmm. They would have, you know, they would have cosmetic counters at the, at the PX on bases, which is cool. But so I felt like, we like I was constantly being swept under the rug. Yeah. Our yeah. account executive, like she really loved her naval bases because they, they made more money. And so whenever I needed something, I would sometimes leave her a voicemail and, you know, not hear from her for two or three weeks. And it was just like, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that was really frustrating. Like there was this weird hierarchy there that I, I didn't care for. Um, yeah, I felt very unsupported. Um, and so that was something I didn't like about the job. And, and it was also like working in that particular store at Bancroft Clothing, since I was the only counter, um, it was kind of like, I felt like I was on this island, you know, like there weren't any other (laughs) counters where we could, you know, we were working together. It was just like, I was kind of just there on my own. Um, I would hire, you know, well, I wouldn't hire, but the manager would hire part-timers. I usually wouldn't see them because they would be working on my days off. And so that, um, that was really frustrating. Um, also I think because 
the market kind of got strangely oversaturated, like you were talking about a, f- a little while ago, with Sephora and big department stores and, you know, QVC and the internet and everything else. Like, people just, a lot of times, like, um, how do I want to put it? They would be like, well, why don't you have, you know, this, that, or the other? Like I saw it at Sephora or, you know, that was, or why don't you have a gift? Macy's is in gift right now. It's like, yeah, Macy's is in gift and then we'll be in gift and, you know, next month or whenever. And um, people didn't understand that they couldn't just bring back something to my counter that they bought at Nordstrom's and they would throw a fit over that. <laughs> really? Oh, Yeah. Oh my goodness. That is crazy to me. Like, obviously, it's not the same. Although, like, I've seen people, you know, at the airport Starbucks getting angry that they can't use their Starbucks gift card. And it's like, well, this is obviously like a weird, like, franchise Starbucks, you know? Oh my goodness. That is ridiculous to me. Uh, And the bigger department stores even put their own little, um, their own little code, you know, their own little barcode that they scan, you know, and it'll say Macy's or Nordstrom's and it's their own code so that, you know, it goes right into their computer. And I would always try to explain it to people because I think, you know, maybe if someone understands, then they'll, you know, then they'll get it. And sometimes people were open to hearing me, but a lot of times they weren't. And I remember one woman throwing a fit and she's like, I have always had to do my returns, you know, like I could do them at any counter. And I was like, when's the last time you returned something? (laughs) <laughs> she's like, well, I don't know. It was probably uh, 15 years ago because I'm usually happy with my products. I was like, yeah, things have changed, you know? And Oh, my gosh. It's, it's due in part to inventory control and everything else. I said, you know, if we return something that you bought at Nordstrom, that comes out of my daily total. But you bought it right. from Nordstrom, so it should come out of theirs and it should co- like affect their inventory control rather than mine. And I, you know, would tell people, I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but, you know, and they, it was just like, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, I can't bend over backwards and, <laughs> you know, make this happen yeah, for you. But. Yeah, that is so ridiculous. I mean, I guess I'm not surprised. Like, I mean, I told you the story of the, the slippers that kept getting returned. Because oh my God. People, yes. Yeah. They, for some, basically, I think I've told this story on the show before, but maybe I haven't, but we had this rash of like, well, okay. So we sold these slippers that we called mucklucks, which I'm sure is cultural appropriation, but they were basically just like slippers that were like calf high made of like sweater material, like in patterns and like faux fleece lining. They were not shoes. Mm-hmm. They did not have a sole, right? It was like knit on the bottom. And we had this rash of people returning them after Christmas because they'd worn them outside in the snow and got ruined. Oh and my I was like, well, they're slippers. And they'd be like, no, they're not. They're boots. Like the customers were like, these are boots. I'd be like, what is going on here? These are clearly not real shoes. They don't have a sole. Like what? What is wrong with everyone? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. And you're like, they d- <laughs> These are not shoes. Who they're raised not you? Shoes. They're indoors. So you know, they're, they're meant to be worn indoors. Yeah. Yeah. But people would be like, these boots are garbage. And it would be like, oh, these slippers. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll take them back. But these are slippers. I don't think you want to exchange for another pair because they are for indoor wear. <laughs> like trying to be so calm with people who were being just so ridiculous. Like, I can't believe how terrible these boots are that you sold me. I'm like, oh my God. Like these are slippers. Um, well, you brought up something that I know is something you want to talk about, which is the gift with purchase. And I feel like gift with purchase has changed over time, right? Like I don't think Sephora really does that. No, I don't think they do either. You can do like get points yeah. or samples and stuff like that, but it's not like come into the Clinique counter and spend $30 and get this seven piece gift set that always includes dramatically different yes. moisturizers. Oh my God. And usually the high impact <laughs> mascara. <laughs> yep. A little tester of happy always. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so, Why don't you tell everybody about that? Because I bet some people who are listening don't really remember this era of free gift with purchase. And I just want to talk about like why Clinique would do that, um, how it worked, uh, how it 
push sales and, you know, what happened to what's left over? I know you've got all kinds of information about all of that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, gift with purchase, well, free gift with purchase are four words that still make my blood run cold. Um, <laughs> You know, and the thing is, is like I say, my mom was a big fan of Clinique and also Estee Lauder. So we, she, to this day, I mean, she loves her free gift with purchase. I still, I still get excited about it sometimes as a, you know, as a consumer. Um, but, you know, so I grew up with my mom going and, you know, getting what she needed at the Clinique counter because it was gift time, you know, and being really excited about the gift, you know, Oh, look Mm -hmm. at this cute bag. And, you know, sometimes she would give me stuff she wasn't going to use, you know, and, um, yeah. So it, it's a nice perk for the customer. Okay. That's how it started out so that you could, um, give a little goodie bag to your customers when they spent it for a long time, it was twenty one fifty or more, which was the price of a, a regular size of the dramatically different moisturizing lotion. Wow. Like you, yeah. So for the longest time, if you bought, if you went in for your lotion during gift, you would get, you know, you would get your goodie bag. And so, um, Every counter, it may have changed since since I left in 2017, but every counter um, has two gifts a year. And the way it was done was that Macy's would have their gift. Mm-hmm. And then maybe the next month, Nordstrom would have their gift. We would have ours. Um, the other McCullough stores would have theirs. So somebody was almost always in gift, and there were never any gift with purchases during the Christmas season. Interesting. And we tried our best every year to get our gift with purchase to coincide with the beginning of the semesters at um, UC Berkeley. So we would try to do a gift like in late August, early September. And then we would do another gift like in the beginning of February, because that's when, you know, that's when the spring semester would start. So it was kind of like back to school. Oh, and we've got this gift going on. Mm -hmm. Um, the gift was, I, we would, for a long time, we got really busy during the gift, which was cool in a lot of ways, but, um, there were, I, what I saw over the years was there were so many customers who I would never see them unless we were having a gift. <laughs> I was wondering if there were people who just went from store to store getting their gifts. They do. Yeah. And then I would talk to the ladies at the, um, the other counters at the, the other McCullough's stores and, um, and like we would all go to training together and whatnot. So we knew each other. Um, we just didn't get to work alongside each other. Um, but I remember like we would always, you know, have gift with purchase abbreviated as GWP. So I, you know, would get frustrated with the, with, you know, the customers that you'd only see them when there was something free. And I started calling them gwippers. It's <laughs> <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And people like, I just was astounded at how entitled and nasty people can get over a bag of free sample size cosmetics and skincare <laughs> products. Seriously. I mean, not surprised over here. <laughs> you know, and the thing was with the gift of purchase, like it was supposed to be one gift per customer. Mm-hmm. And over the years, there were so many regular customers that were loyal and I would bend the rules a little bit. And I was told by my store manager and my account executive that that was fine to do. Sometimes we would have um, a choice of two gifts. Like there'd be like, you know, your choice of either day or night or violet or, and, or rose, you know, or whatever. And um, it would be different bags and like the same type of products in the bag, but maybe different color palettes of, you know, the eyeshadow blush palette and then a different lipstick in each one or whatever. So sometimes for regular customers, what I would, as as I got to know them, I'd say, okay, well, I know, you know, you have a daughter, so, and you're buying, you know, $80 worth of stuff. So what I'd like to do is break up your purchase. That way you get a gift. Mm, I like that. You you, You get one of each gift or, you know, I'll break up your purchase so that you get one for, you know, even if it was one gift set, just be like, okay, well, I know, you know, you want to give one to your daughter, so we'll do it that way. And the thing is, those customers were always 
so sweet. And they were like, oh my gosh, thank you. But I would get people coming in arguing with me saying like, I'm spending a hundred dollars. You should give me three or four gifts. And I would explain to them, no, I can't do that. And here's why. And then I would like show them the fine print on the little, um, like the little flyers that we had for the gift. And I would be like, look, it's one per customer. A lot of times if they were making a a very big purchase, like a hundred dollars or something, I say, I can give you two. I can do that. But that, you know, or I would get people that would get a gift and they would try coming back in like five times during the <laughs> the two weeks that we were doing gift of course, with purchase. I remember one woman did. lied to me and said, she's like, no, I've never been here before. I just flew into town this morning. And I was like, you've been here three times already. And I just thought to myself, if what you have to do to feel like you have a little bit of power in your life is lie to the Clinique counter lady... <laughs> <laughs> to get another gift, like, okay, you just knock yourself out, like, fine, you know? Right, right. <laughs> I mean, that is so, I mean, none of this surprises me because I've I've worked enough retail to see yeah. the dark side of humanity when it comes to free things or deals. Yeah, or I, I don't like this lipstick. Can you, can you swap it for another one? No, I'm sorry. The bags are pre-sealed or, you know, if we had a choice of two. Well, can I get it with this eyeshadow and that lipstick? And can, no, I'm sorry. The bags are sealed. You know, it's all put together. But I don't like this one. And it's like... <laughs> Yeah, like, oh, well, it's free. It's free. Yeah. It's free. Yeah. You know, and um, so another thing about the gift was that we had what was called an AUS goal for the gift. Okay. So we had our regular daily goals and, you know, we wanted to give away like, you know, they'd send us like however many cases of gifts and there'd be, I think it was like 24 in each case. And so I had to keep track of everything. And I had to, you know, we had like a little table to write everything down on and I'd have to fax it to my account executive at the end of the day. And I, and I love doing stuff like that, you know, so that wasn't a problem for me. But we had the AUS, which was average unit sale. Mm-hmm. So that means how much did this person spend when they bought this gift? Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so like the minimum purchase for the gift, let's say it was twenty one fifty, but our AUS would be like $48. So you would want to, like, you would want to get people to buy more than just the minimum. You would try to get them to spend at least $48. Which is a lot if, like, you have to spend twenty one fifty to get the gift. Right. Like, that's a lot. Right. So... So what would happen um, if you didn't meet those goals? Like, were there repercussions? Yeah, I would get barked at. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would get barked at. I would get berated. And, you know, it was just um, the the account executive at the time was just, you know, not um, – she was very demanding, but then I say, like I say, you know, when I needed something, she wasn't very supportive. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so a lot of times when someone did come in and they spent, let's say they spent a hundred dollars on, you know, whatever they were buying and they, they just, they just wanted the one gift and they were like, Oh, thanks for the gift. You know, that would bolster my sales for the people who, for the gwippers that would come in and be like, I just want my moisturizer so I can get my gift, you know? Right. (laughs) Gwippers. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, like, a lot of my regular customers, they would do what my mom had had always done, where they would come in with a list of all the things they needed, and they'd been waiting for the gift, mm-hmm. you know, and they would just restock everything they needed, you know, so they would spend like $200. So for that, I was like, yeah, I'm happy to break up this purchase for you. It's not really hurting my because I would think like, I'm, you know, showing them that I appreciate their business and it's not really dragging my AUS down too much. Right. You know, but those, the gripper types that come in that just want to spend the bare minimum and, you know, they, um, they really drag down the AUS, <laughs> you know, yeah. and sometimes we would get so busy and I was the, and a lot of times I'd be the only one there. So it was like, I just have to get people in and out and, you know, get them rung up because I've got three other people waiting and, you know, it, it was a lot, you know, it was a juggling act for sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. So would you have leftover gifts or would they all get bought up? 
Because I always felt like you had to rush in there and get it because they might run out. Most of the time we ended up with leftover gifts. Like how much? I mean, towards the end, our business took a nosedive. I kind of like, I for a while I was building up, building up, building up over the years. And I, I remember one year, I can't remember the exact year that it was, but I really, you know, I really had a great gift and I was so proud of myself. And we were running out and the, the account executive actually had a couple more cases sent to me and I blew through those. So I was like, yes, you know, I was so happy. And, um, and then after that, like we had an, I remember we had another gift that year, like the, the spring gift and it, it did. Okay. I think sometimes what the account executive would let me do was like extend it for another three days. If she, if it looked like, okay, three days and we'll get rid of all of it, you know? So sometimes I was Mm -hmm, able to extend mm -hmm. the gift. And then after that, after that one particular, you know, awesome gift that I had, it just slowly went on a decline. And so towards the end, like our gifts were not, they just were not doing well at all. And so we were supposed to send the gifts back to, you know, the warehouse or whatever, and the unused gifts. And we were supposed to, (laughs) we were supposed to pay for the shipping. And um, Mm -hmm. the guy that was like, one of the overall managers of our store, he was the son of the department store chain's founder. Oh, yeah. Good Lord. And I wrote about him in the article for the blog. <laughs> yes. Yes. Which everyone should go read. I'll link it in the show notes because you have to read it to believe it. Oh my God. So he was, I will just give you a brief synopsis. Um, This was someone who grew up with money and, you know, never like, you know, went to school and then like his daddy gave him a job basically, which great for him, but, uh, he was extremely cheap and, um, not really the best person, not the best person to work for by a long shot. So his, uh, cheapness came through in that he did not want to pay for shipping and would like ball me out. Like, well, why didn't you have a better gift? Why am I having to send these back? It's like, why don't you just shut up? pay for the shipping, which is a business expense and just send them back, you know, because that's what we're supposed to do. We were supposed to do the same thing with um, seasonal gift sets that didn't sell. I wonder what happened to them when you sent them back. What do you think happened? Well, what happened to them back then was they would get um, either, you know, they would be held on to and they would open up the, the, you know, the little plastic gift bags like the, that contained all the, the sample sizes and they would read, they would hold on to them and then put them into future gifts. Oh, so smart. That's why they always have dramatically different moisturizer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they would read, they would redistribute you know, the, the, the items, which I think is a really good idea. I don't know what they did with the bags. A lot of times the holiday gift sets would then be sent um, to the outlet stores where they would be sold at a discount. Oh, back when outlets were real. Yes. Yeah, exactly. The store manager was like, well, why can't we just sell them at a discount here? And I was like, cause that's not how it works. That's not what we're supposed to do. So <laughs> we like in our store in particular and the other, um, the other McCullough's stores, I'll just say like every store had an issue with cosmetics, you know, unsold and, um, unused gifts, you know, unsold, uh, holiday packs and seasonal packages, and then gifts like piling up in like my, at one point, like my backstock closet, I was just like, we have got to send these back. We have got Mm -hmm. to. And then, you know, it's like, well, you should have sold them. And it's like, yeah, but they didn't sell. I tried my best. Exactly. They didn't (sighs) sell. That ship has sailed, you know, and like maybe we should stop. Maybe whoever is, you know, in charge of ordering these needs to stop ordering so many because they're not selling like they, you know, like they might at other places. You know, why are we getting 12 like happy gift sets when, you know, I usually sell four. Because we're in Berkeley and people don't buy fragrance like that, you know? <laughs> right. Uh, or, you know, whatever it is. And you certain things like three-step kits and when we get like the extra large bottles of the moisturizer, um, those I usually had no problem selling through. Mm-hmm. 
because there was something practical and that was what our customer base liked, you know, but like the, the fragrance sets and the, pa- the, the special like holiday makeup kits, you know, I had, I had a little trouble with those, you know, because they didn't have such a wide appeal in, in our store. And, but the thing is, it's like, well, this is, this is the procedure for what we're supposed to do. And you're refer, you are so cheap that you are not following the corporate procedure to send this stuff back. And it's piling up and you're yelling at me, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so finally the, the other store manager who was in charge of her name was Katie. She was in charge of the juniors count, the juniors department, and then the Clinique counter. Um, I was like, you know, I'll call him Dick like I did in the article. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah, it fits in, believe me. I was like, well, Dick doesn't want to send back these gifts. They're piling up. She said, you know what? Let's just, she said, let's just slash open all these, you know, bags of, you know, the, the little plastic bags. She says, let's just put them in a big bowl or a big box and you can just throw them in people's bags until they're gone. You just, you know, when someone comes in and buys a couple things, she said, you know, let them pick something, let them pick two things or whatever. She says, let's come up with something where they spend this much and then they can pick however many. I was like, okay, great. You know, and then she said, we can offer people the little, you know, the little zip up bags if they want them, you know, to use as a travel bag. So that was what we did with the ones that were piled up. And the customers loved that um, because it was like Halloween (laughs) 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 for makeup, you know. So I was so happy that we, you know, it was like, okay, between the two of us, we came up with a, you know, very nice solution to get rid of all this stuff. Yeah, but we were supposed to send stuff back. And it turns out that the other McCullough's uh, stores you know, in regards to the, the holiday and seasonal packages, um, they had them all piled up too. So it wasn't just me, you know, Ugh, and yeah, they were refusing, you know, this the people were refusing in uh, management were refusing to pay for the shipping. It's just like, come on. And I remember the account executive was barking at me about it. I was just like, I'm trying my best. You know, I'm not the one you need to convince. Right. You know, talk, talk to Dick. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, she didn't want to talk to him. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, she didn't. I mean, he sounds like well, a real Dick, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, it seems like in a lot of ways, both the company, like Clinique itself, and and you, really worked to. I don't know, reduce waste, but is there a lot of waste in the world of beauty counters? Yes, there absolutely is. Um, It's appalling. And sometimes, you know, when they would send us like a a new product would come out or we would get, like I was saying, like the seasonal color palettes or whatever, um, it would be this huge box with tons of that puffed, you know, air puffed plastic uh, packing uh, material. Yeah. And there would be like three eyeshadow palettes and maybe three eyeliners or, you know, whatever seasonal goods in there, like in this, you know, in this huge box. And it was, you know, or sometimes when they would send the staff our freebies, it would be like a jar of moisturizer in a huge box with all this packing material. I mean, it was just <sighs> ridiculous. The worst. And then there's the whole, um, uh, everything around the waste re- reg- with um, the customer returns. Yeah. So what happens with returns? Because mm-hmm. a while back I watched a crazy video about returns at Ulta and there was literally a woman spraying dry shampoo into a trash bag Oh my! God. because they're not allowed to like put it out or donate it. Yeah. And that was basically what we had to do. Now, was, see, now this was an area where like the, like Dick's cheapness actually <laughs> was okay, you know, because uh, I remember Katie and I talking about it. It's like, well, I don't want to just, you know, this is a perfectly good lipstick. This person bought it and they they didn't like it after they wore it for a couple of days. So what we would do is um, turn it into a tester. You know, that way I don't have to pull, I don't have to pull a new lipstick mm-hmm. out of, out of my stock and make a tester out of it. So I kept everything organized in the back 
um, that I, I would be able to use again as future testers. And I was able to clean and sanitize everything like I would for the lipsticks, you know, that people that are on the tester unit. So I would um, spritz it with alcohol and then wipe it off with the tissue. And really, that's all you have to do. I, someone's probably going to write in and be like, no, that's not all you have to do. But that, that's how we were taught, you know, in training. Um, and so mm-hmm. things like skincare products and um, you wouldn't want to do anything, you know, that you're going to use on your eye, like a mascara or an eyeliner. Well, an eyeliner you can clean off, um, but a mascara, you're just going to have to throw that out. Um, but foundations and, and, lipsticks and whatnot, there were ways to sanitize them. So I was able to reuse a lot of them as testers, which I like doing, but I was supposed to like, ultimately what you're supposed to do is like, if it's a lipstick, break off the lipstick from, you know, the, the base where it's, you know, anchored into the tube, break it off into the garbage and throw everything out. If it's something in a, you know, like a, a, eyeshadow or blush that's in a pan, you're supposed to scrape it out like with a screwdriver or a pen or something. Um, Foundations, dump them down, you know, dump them down the drain or into the garbage, Um, you know, and then we had a log of, you know, everything, uh, all the testers and damages. So we would get credit for them. So we would have to fill that out. And, you know, the, you don't want okay. a lot of returns because it comes out of your daily total for the day that it gets returned. Like if somebody buys something on a Monday and they return it on a Friday, um, you know, that went, it went into your daily total on Monday and then it comes out of it on Friday, you know. Um, also, you just want people to be happy with their products right. and to use it and, and enjoy it. So it was like, oh, you know, like uh, try to do what, whatever you can to keep the returns to a minimum, which is another reason why I didn't like uh, pressuring people into buying stuff that they were unsure of. I didn't want people. Re- yeah. I didn't want people to have buyer's remorse yeah, exactly. and be like, I really don't like this color or whatever. And, you know, like here, let me make you a sample of this. So, you know, you can see how you like it. Make sure that it is compatible with your skin, t- your skin type you know, so that you're not saying, Oh my God, this gave me a rash. I have to return it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there was that. I remember I had one young woman, she was a student at UC Berkeley and she kept coming in and buying lipsticks and returning them. And she refused to test them out in the store because she was so afraid of you know, the germ factor. And I, I can understand that, but I would show her how I sanitized everything, you know, with the alcohol and the tissue and all of that. And I'd say, you know, I, I wear lipsticks off the tester unit off the, all the time. When we get new colors in, I try them out. Or, you know, if it's a color I haven't tried yet, I'll, you know, so I'm, this is, I'm not telling you to do something that I don't do myself, you know? And I, I remember I cleaned off a lipstick in front of her and put it on. And I said, just, right. just to give you some security around that. She's like, no, I don't feel comfortable. And then, you know, over the span of like two weeks, she must have bought and returned si- six lipsticks. And then she's like, well, can't you just turn them into testers? Uh, Why do you, you know? And I was just like, you know, like it's wasteful ultimately. Yes. Very much so. Good Lord. (laughs) Thank you so much to Susan for taking the time to talk to me. She'll be back in the next episode for the second half of our conversation. And in the meantime, I'd like to hear from you. What's a product you've been on a quest to find the less wasteful version of? Maybe, Maybe we can help you out here or maybe you have some suggestions of your own. What's a tip you have for using less and impulsively purchasing less? What's a product we'll pry from your cold, dead hands? Tell us all about it. You can either call the Clothes Horse hotline, the number is in the show notes, or you can record an audio message on your phone and send it to me via email. Or you can just send me an email where you tell me. And that email is amanda at clotheshorse.world. Hey, everyone. I'm so excited to announce that one of my favorite brands, New Works, is an official sponsor of Clothes Horse. 
I've been a fan of Newark's for a long time because they have unique prints created by some of my favorite artists. If you're looking for an article of clothing that you can proudly outfit repeat for years and years and still receive compliments from strangers everywhere you go, Newark's is the brand for you. Seriously, one of my all-time favorite Newark's purchases is the Dahlia mock neck dress in the Ash and Chess print Better Days. Everywhere I go, someone is blown away. I may have recently received a free breakfast taco from a barista just for telling them where I got my dress. I've also found that while all of the Newark's prints are unique conversation starters, all of the pieces themselves are easy to mix and match into an almost infinite array of outfits. Dress them up, dress them down. The outfit repeating potential here is massive. The silhouettes are designed to make you feel good, happy, and just generally full of positive vibes. And Newworks offers sizes extra small through 5X with plans to continue to expand sizing. And oh yeah, they make adorable kids clothes too. Well, now that we've covered all of the aesthetic reasons I love Newworks, let's get into the serious stuff. In a world where it's progress, not perfection, Newworks is constantly striving to do better and better, always with an eye on progress when it comes to sustainability. All Newworks products are made by a small team in limited batches in California. You won't see any ridiculous waste over here. In fact, the company is constantly working to reduce their waste. As part of this commitment, Newworks has been offering packs of scraps for all of you crafty types to turn into your own cool, unique projects. And they even sold a few zero waste pieces recently, which was really so cool and something you just don't see out there as much as you should, right? On top of that, Newworks now offers Full Circle, a resale platform for Newworks products because the idea is that these clothes should remain in circulation and be worn just as much as possible for as long as possible. Newworks is a woman-owned, women-run business. There are no venture capitalists or big investors involved, just a small team of incredibly nice people. And they're working hard to do the best they can for the planet and its people. Everyone involved in creating Newworks products are paid a living wage. And Newworks tries to source all of their materials in the USA and work only with incredibly nice people. Their hope is that every Newworks purchase will be a shiny shining gem in your closet that you will cherish forever or hand down to someone you love. Once again, I'm just so proud and so honored to have this amazing brand as a sponsor of my work here at Close Horse. Go see why I love them so much at newworks.com or find them on Instagram at newworks. And that's new N-O-O. Perfection is the enemy of progress because it sets us up for disappointment, for failure, and ultimately disenchantment and surrender. Trying to achieve perfection is exhausting and it's, it's way too easy to compare your own progress to someone else's and feel like a failure. We all do that, right? Or you might feel as if you're such a mess that there's no way you could ever make a difference in this world. All of these dark feelings, all of this frustration, these bad vibes, they all are the fast track to quitting, to just giving up, to throwing your hands in the air, buying a Keurig machine, just only buying plastic from now on, only drinking water from plastic bottles. It sort of turns you upside down where Rather than just giving up on your mission, you kind of swing the opposite direction and just like, I'm a nihilist. I believe in nothing. We don't need that. The thing about progress, if you look up the definition, progress is making gradual steps forward. Gradual. It's not, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not a light switch. It's, it's getting there slowly, but still getting there. And that sounds pretty great, Right. We're all taking a different path to reducing our consumption and fighting for a better, more equitable world. We're all, we're all doing different things. But no matter the route we're taking, 
we will end up at the same place. For some of us, that might mean shopping secondhand or giving up the Ziploc bag habit. It feels good when you do, I promise. Trying out bar shampoo, mending what you already have. Others are sewing their own clothes or having tough conversations with those around them. Some of us, or most of us, I hope, are calling our elected representatives. Your path shouldn't look like everybody else's as long as you're on a path. That's what counts. Perfection for many of us would involve an immediate reboot of our lives. You turn it off and turn it back on again. And you know this, if you've ever tried some really intense New Year's resolutions and failed by mid-January, you know what a challenge that is. You just, you just can't do it. I know we all want it to all happen really fast. Listen, this is a conversation I have with myself constantly where I'm like, why are people still buying clothes from Shein? <laughs> you know, I wanted to stop five minutes ago, but that's that's just not how it's going to happen, you know? And that's not going to how change is going to happen in our own individual lives as well. I did a bunch of reading this week about how to make the most progress within our lives without being overwhelmed and disappointed. I went deep into all kinds of psychology and self-help stuff. Here's my advice after reading all of that. First off, start small. Like I said, rather than deciding to reboot your entire life overnight, try integrating one or two changes into your life each month. Don't confuse an ideal, instantaneous, fast outcome with a realistic, long-lasting, impactful one. I'm going to talk more about that in a bit and my own experience with that. So sit tight. Next, ask yourself, why is this important to me? It's so, oh, you have to have that conversation with yourself. You know why? Because knowing that answer and being able to remind yourself of that will give you the motivation to keep going, to stick to it, and continue to make more changes in your life. Next, Don't give up after minor setbacks. Did you forget to bring your reusable bags to the grocery store and now you have to buy bags? Listen, that happened to me this week. We got to Austin. We have no idea where our reusable tote bags is. Honestly, I'm really concerned because they've always lived in the back of our car and they're not in there. Where are they? We'll figure it out. But I was at the grocery store being really angry at myself because we had to buy three bags. Well, guess what? It's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean I'm a failure. I'm not going to stop making clothes horse or, like I said, buy a Keurig and just call it call it the end. I'm going to find other uses for those bags. I'm going to use the hell out of them. And I'm going to figure out, fingers crossed eventually, where are all of our reusable tote bags. And you know what? Everything's going to be okay. The next one is a really important one. Don't be afraid to try and maybe fail or not be that great at first. That's just how it goes sometimes, right? We are all new at something at some point. Are you nervous about thrifting for the first time or worried that you're going to destroy your clothes by trying to mend them yourself? Guess what? It's worth trying. Nothing changes if we don't try. And the more we try, the better we get at it. It's really important this next one, to give yourself credit for your commitment to change and all of that hard work you're doing. Pat yourself on the back for trying something new, keeping it up, making these tough changes. You deserve all kinds of credit from yourself and everyone around you. Be happy with the progress you've made. Don't compare yourself to others. I know it's hard. I do it to myself all the time. Progress isn't linear. It's not instant and it's not a direct path. It's a squiggly line that moves backwards occasionally. It takes a left turn, takes a right turn, but it always moves forward over time. Remember, progress is gradual change. Embrace the community around you. Real change happens when we're all working together. We can support one another give people one another advice, share our best ideas, and root one another on as we make these changes in our lives. I told you I was going to tell you how I 
integrated gradual changes into my life. Here's how I was able to have make some major positive changes in both my life and in my habits. It's a technique I continue to use year after year. About seven years ago, I was in a really terrible place. I mean, I was just so unhappy. I hated my job. I couldn't stop being involved in toxic relationships. Go listen to the department if you want to hear about the raccoon guy. He's just one example, but that was happening around this time. I had bad friends. I had bad relationships. And I just was so sad. That year, I challenged myself to change and add two things to my life each month that would improve the quality of my life and my health. The idea was that after four weeks of those two changes, I would be ready to add two more, then two more the next month, etc. And each change would become permanent as the new one joined. In the first month, you know, I got a library card, which sounds simple, but it was an amazing choice. I was reading so much more and I was saving money on books and saving paper and all of that. I also subscribed to a produce box that first month and I started cooking my own meals and packing my own lunch. And so I was eating healthier, saving money, saving packaging. I still do that. The next month I joined a car share so I could get out of the city occasionally, get some nature time and some perspective. And I also found myself a therapist, which we know if you have the privilege and access to therapy, it can be a game changer. These gradual changes went on for an entire year. And guess what? Not only did all of those changes become lifelong habits, I also felt so much better at the end of that year, like better in every way, financially, emotionally, physically. It was, it was great. This is a great way to shift to, into a more sustainable lifestyle this year. I'm working on my own list for this year, which to be fair, I probably should have it already, but moving is kind of frying my brain right now. But I'm excited to continue making impactful changes in my life. In past years, it's included buying only secondhand clothing for a year, getting rid of the plastic in my shower, giving up manicures, and all kinds of other changes to my consumption habits. No more impulse makeup, for example. And you know what? It's been pretty successful. And I always feel happy at the end. I'm like, wow, that small thing made a big impact. And like, there's so much less plastic in our recycling bin, or now we're just, we leave a tiny bag of trash each week. Like these are big deals to me. We know that one person acting alone can't change the world, but when we all work together on both individual and large scale changes, there is major impact. And what you do matters. What I do matters. All of us matter in this movement. So let's get to work together. I'm so excited, excited being an understatement, to see all the radical positive things we're going to accomplish this year. We've got this. We're going to do it. Thanks for listening to Close Horse, written, researched, hosted, and edited by me, Amanda Lee McCarty. If you're enjoying yourself, which I hope you did if you got this far, please leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. And of course, tell your friends. That's how we get more people involved in this movement. If you'd like to support my work, please check out patreon.com slash clothes horse podcast. Thanks as always to Justin Travis White. He's not just my husband. He's not just a guy I load moving trucks with. He also provides our music and audio support. All right, till next week. Bye.